having me, Jed. Cool. And I've got him on speakerphone, so hopefully that registers all right with the video. That's why I'm standing behind the camera. So the reason I brought Josh in, we've been looking at the, uh, he's a coaching client of mine. And one of the things that we've been talking about is some of the data analysis for qualifiers for nationals. So what he did is he analyzed some of the data for the Napalm Nightmare World Championships that just took place last weekend. So um, what he did is he, and also the reason for this call is because I just got a question from a fellow named Ryan. And his question was, possible Q&A candidate, what are some respectable numbers on Napalm's Nightmare handles based on what you know? As in, what would be what would put someone above average in some sort of metric? I know it is not an exact science, but just like deadlifting double your body weight is a vague metric in powerlifting, what would a possible grip standard be? So I asked Ryan if he was familiar with the top 100 list, and he said yes. But is it just placing in the top 50% that year that makes you above average, or would it just be a particular number regardless of rank? 200 pounds on the three inch block, etc. One must reach to be considered above average. So what we did, like I said, Josh went through a bunch of stuff and grabbed some numbers. And um, what I've got here is we looked at, we just condensed it down to two and three eighths Napalm's Nightmare. And these are the numbers from the contest on this side. So you can see NNWC, it's got the weight class, it's got the mean weight lifted out of those lifters, and then what the what they would uh, the number that would be required for the seventy fifth percentile. Is that right, Josh? That's correct. Okay. And then um, once we got talking about doing this, I thought, how hard would it be to pull up the results from the top one hundred list? So he went and pulled that up in about eight seconds. This guy is a stud. So we've got so and also to go back. You notice we didn't include numbers for the 59 and 66 kilo class just because there was only one lifter in each class. But you have a little bit more data in the top 100. So you have the 59, 66, 74, 83, 93, 105, 120, and 120 plus weight classes. Those are kilos. You have the mean weight lifted that you can see there in that column under the word mean. You have the 75th percentile underneath the column that says 75 percent you have the top weight lifted under where it says top and then n is the number of people in that category is all that correct josh yeah that's correct all right so based on your years of experience analyzing data along these lines what what else can you tell us about these results so let's start with some people might not be very familiar with statistics. Mm -hmm. So the mean is actually, it's not the average, like you would get a traditional average. If you add 50 and 100, you divide by two, you know, you get halfway between. That would normally is how we calculate averages. That's not what we do in statistics. What we actually do is we want to use the mean, which is how often does that number show up? Right. So it becomes a bell curve mm -hmm. and where you fall on that bell curve at the very top of the bell curve is the number that happens most often. So when you look at those mean numbers, that weight is the weight that the majority of the contestants got for that weight class. OK. And then as you move to the right of the bell curve, now you start to get up in the top 75 percent. So, you know, you're definitely, if you're between those two numbers, you're going to be above average. Right. If you're right at the median, you're going to be average. And, but that is also comparing against just the people who are in the contest. You know, all these guys are seasoned lifters, you know, probably the majority of them have done several contests. If you, if you want to compare yourself against those guys, those are definitely the numbers to use. That's good information. And the other thing I was thinking of is we could even break this down further, but I didn't think about it until about 10 minutes before we started talking. Um, I think there's a way to isolate each weight class because right now, we're, if we're looking at the top 100, you're looking at the top 100 best performances. So it's going to be really tough for an individual that's in the 59 or 66 kilo class 
to um, to get into that top 100 when they're going against all these beasts that are over you know 231 pounds. So, because if you look over at the end column, you can see in the top 100, there's only 12 people out of that top 100 that show up out of the 74, 66, and 59 kilo class. So there is a way to even break this down further as far as performances. And, um, you know, we started out using uh, this project here as a way to figure out who should be invited to nationals based on their performance for on the, the various napalm handles. So, um, you know, this by no means is like a, a, a complete 100% breakdown of all the available information. It's just what Josh had at his fingertips and, you know, in a matter of minutes. So that's important to understand too. That's exactly right, Jed. Because the other thing you got to be careful with if you're going to compare yourself against that list of the top 100, those are the top 100 guys in the in the world, right? That was I pulled the numbers from the world's list. Yeah. Yep. So that number is going to be skewed to the right of that bell curve because you're already looking at the top 100 guys. Yeah. Now, also, the one other thing I might want to mention is that the Napalm Nightmare doesn't have as many numbers as, say, something like the Flask or the Two and a Quarter Crusher. The, mm -hmm. the implements that get used in the King Kong, there's a lot more people putting up a lot more numbers. So those numbers are actually going to be more accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And this also, um, another thing is like this includes people that may have done grip one time. This includes people that may have done grip for a couple of years, but then they haven't done it since 2020, you know? So, um, you know, there is some limitations to the data, so we can dive into this further, but I think this is a good way to start out. So what would you say to Ryan, who's trying to figure out if he's above average? Would he look at just the 75% number based on his weight class? Or would you suggest for someone who, you know, I don't know any other information about Ryan. I don't know if he's a competitor or uh, if he's just like leisure interest in the grip or he's just starting out. You know what I mean? What would you suggest to him? Yeah, I would I would start. I would look at the mean average and figure out where you land on that, because that's going to be where the majority of that weight class, that's going to be your average. And if you're slightly above that, you're slightly above average. If you start getting up into that 75 percent, though, now that's tall cotton. You're starting to get into the more elite level athletes because um, above that is where you're you're looking at your 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 strongest. The guys who are winning their weight classes, they're not going to be at that level. They're going to be in what we call the whisker. So that would be everything between twenty five the seventy five percent and a hundred percent. If you're looking to win contests, you want to be there. If you're just wanting to be stronger than your friends, you want to be just above average. So mm -hmm. it depends on what your goal is, really. That's good information, dude. And then uh, how much does me cutting weight from going going from the 120 plus class down to the 105 class in about a year and a half, how much does that mess everything up? That probably just throws a giant monkey wrench into everything and I just ruined the whole study, right? Or no? Well, no, because the way we keep track of the information is we have your lift at 120 plus and we also have your lift at 105. So now what we can do is we put both of those numbers into the study and then it will tell you how you did at that level. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point I'm hoping to dive deeper into this data and see if the weight is actually influencing people's strengths or not. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome information because that's been something that's been debated for years. And I think we could talk about that for a long time. But, um, you know, I've it, and this is where more information would really help us out. So what Josh and I were doing, we were talking, we were doing a coaching call sometime before the meet. And we talked about collecting um, data as far as like hand length measurements, forearm size, bicep size, height, weight, stuff like that, so that we can, um, what is that called, Josh, when you compare so many variables all at the same time? There's a word for it, I think. 
is it a is it a cascade or something like that? Is there maybe uh, maybe I'm making that up in my head? There there is a name for it, but it escapes me right at this moment. Um, darn it! If I thought it's it's right on the tip of my tongue. See, uh, I've I've been involved on the on just on the cusp with um, continuous improvement and some stuff related to you know uh, in in the workforce. It's called. Um, Six Sigma, you know, things along those lines. So I'm, you know, I've brushed up against this and I, for whatever reason, I can't think of it either, but my memory sucks, but I don't feel so bad since you can't remember it either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, well, listen, dude, this is great information. I hope we helped out Ryan with his question. And uh, is there anything else that you want to throw in there related to this mini study? Um. Don't take it as gospel. Just take it as a piece of advice. Just add it and plug it into your tool. You know, if you're coming up on a contest, you could use this data to figure out which implement you need to be training harder on. Because mm -hmm. if you're above average on one implement, but you're way behind on the other, you know, now we have a way of trying to figure out what that is and you can focus your energy more effectively. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. It's a good point. It There's always... There's always, you know, more ways to look at things. And um, as we continue to study these numbers, uh, we'll be able to put this stuff out. And uh, Josh, once again, thanks for taking part in this. Um, if people are, are wanna want to look you up on like the internet, where can they find you? Um, the easiest way would probably be my Instagram, and it would be Inbringer Grip Sport. It's all one word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come by and check me out. I'm more than happy to help me help anybody. DM me and we'll work something out. All right, that's End Bringer. E N D B R I N G E R. Thanks a lot, Josh. Appreciate your time. Have a great night. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Jed. All right, we'll see you. Take care. All right, everybody. If you like this video, give it one of these. Be sure to subscribe. Share it with your friends who might also be interested in figuring out where they stand against the world's best. And if they are sitting at the point of being, you know, above average, below average, upper percentiles, it's all right here. It's a good guideline and we'll have more information coming out soon, I'm sure. All right. All the best in your training, everybody. Take care.